we're probably already uh, recording, so I'm going to get going here. I you know, want to welcome all the people who are just uh, joining us now. We're watching Pizza Talk. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and I'm with Noel Broder, in, who's in L.A. Uh, Noel, as uh, many of you know him from different uh, sort of parts of his life, uh, we're going to get into that. But really, I think uh, most recently, a lot of you may know Noel because he's the one who organized the big pizza party, the Zoom pizza party, back in, uh, when was it, at the end of March, early April, it was the first sort of thing that happened during this COVID era, that uh, uh, what happened, as I, as I'll tell it the way I saw it, and then you can tell us what really happened, because we want to hear how you brought it all together, because that was pretty phenomenal, and that was before any of us even knew that Zoom existed, um, it was that uh, a Pizza Expo, where we were all going to meet, and Noel was in charge of putting together a really cool uh, sort of three-day uh, extravaganza at the King Arthur booth and getting a lot of pizza uh, superstars together to do demos. Uh, well, all that got canceled and uh, everybody was kind of like, what are we going to do now? We were counting on getting to see each other and, you know, hang out and do pizza, pizza, pizza. And so Noel came up with this idea of a, uh, a virtual conference that kind of take the place at least to fill the gap. Uh, and after that, he just made it happen. So why don't you tell us a little bit about all that, the genesis of that, and then we'll get into sort of more of your, your own backstory. Whatever you say, Peter, it's your show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was good to have you. So uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, every, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm kind of losing my voice. I've been on Zoom a lot the last uh, uh, two months, and so I, I find myself screaming into the microphone, so pardon me. Well, during uh, the, the, the three days of the, of the, the I don't know what to call it, the, the, the lollipop's loser that you put on with, with Zoom, you were on constantly. It was like you were hardly never on, so I don't even know how you kept that. <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, I kind of thought of it like the Jerry Lewis telethon, except it was, uh, except yeah. it was me, not Jerry Lewis, and it was pretty exhausting. Uh, you know, <laughs> backstory is that, uh, yeah, like, like you mentioned, um, I was planning on going to the Pizza Expo with everybody else, and uh, uh, I help at the King Arthur booth every year with Jeff Yankelo, and he and King Arthur have trusted me the last three years to um, not only put together a team of great pizza people from around the country, <clears throat> but also do a demo stage. And so um, I'll just go back to that real quick, because that was really how this whole thing got started. And I was working with Jeff and Rob DiNapoli and, uh, from DiNapoli Tomatoes, and every year we would just do our best to, besides make great pizza and have fun, to do a, a, our own kind of demo schedule. And, and the first year we were lucky because we were on the, the edge of nowhere. And so you could do whatever you wanted. If you were like, you know, at the ground zero, you had to be really careful and only this many chairs and this much spacing and you got to respect the aisles. But in Siberia, you could do whatever you want. So right. I invited Chris Bianco and Tony G and all these people. Uh, and lots of people that nobody's ever heard of to come and do the same things they do <clears throat> in the halls and in the upstairs rooms of the convention center, but do it on the floor. And it really, really went well. And, you know, we're just trying to spread pizza love and, and have a good time and make great pizza. And so we've ended up doing that every year since then. And it, it was only two years in a row, but it's something that we all look forward to. And then this year we had a great show planned and we had, you know, all kinds of new staff and, it was going to be awesome. And then, of course, first it got postponed, then it got canceled. And I don't know about you, but uh, at, the, at the end of March, I really didn't know what to do with myself. You know, I was going crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm in Santa Monica, and we, had, we were just starting to kind of hunker down. And uh, I'm an active person. You know, I, I work as a – I've been in the restaurant business for 30 years. I, I work for a living. I wish I could say that I didn't sometimes. Yeah, right. You know, I had just came back from a, a five week trip to the Middle East consulting and I had a lot of things going and suddenly I was shutting everything down. And it was kind of depressing and I didn't know what to do with my life. And um, you know, one of the local pizza people here had just done a, a Instagram live kind of thing. And I was like, wow, Instagram live is cool, but I want to do something more. And I've been doing a lot of Zoom calls like everybody else. And I thought, I wonder what this Zoom meeting thing is. And I went on a Zoom webinar to learn more about Zoom meetings and how scalable they were. And that was on a Monday. Yeah. And I started calling people. <clears throat> Rob DiNapoli was one of my first calls. Jeff from King Arthur was my second saying, I don't know how this would work, but I'm thinking about doing like a pizza expo virtually. What do you think? Yeah. And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, kid, but it sounds great. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, good, because I don't know what I'm talking about either. 
<laughs> and then within a week, we were up and running. And by the following Tuesday, we were doing our own little virtual version of the Pizza Expo. And it was incredible how it happened because I really wasn't sure of how it would work at all. And running a Zoom meeting is a lot different than running a Zoom webinar for 500 or 1,000 people. Yeah. As you're learning, Peter, right? So I started calling people, mostly chefs, and I was surprised that for once in my life, my batting average was 1,000. Said yes, and really, how could people say no? We were raising money through through Scott Weiner, Slice Out Hunger. So 100% of the proceeds uh, we're going to go to uh, we're going to go to um, charity. Although at the time it wasn't certain because we didn't really have any sponsors yet. We had, yeah. we had literally lost all our sponsors. So anyway, it turned off. It turned out being a great event. Uh, pretty much everybody showed up, and it didn't matter who showed up and who didn't because we. You know, we had a great uh, a crowd of people that showed up and paid whatever it was, five or 10 bucks. We tried to keep the price low. That's right. Yeah, there was a, like a little registration fee for people. Very low. I think, I think it was five or 10. I can't remember. I forgot about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, and, and some people showed up who weren't, you weren't even expecting. You had a whole schedule worked out of who was going to come on when, and then other people would just sort of drop in and go, that was hey, the best. can I get in that on this? That was the absolute best. And you know, it's funny, like, I mean, uh, you kind of mentioned it before, but I, I was in, the, I've been in the nightclub business and in the music and restaurant business my whole life. So I'm used to everything from, you know, uh, flights being delayed for bands to, uh, to dishwashers and servers and bartenders not showing up. So I'm ready to jump in anyway. I'll wash dishes. I can't really sing, but I've played the piano here and there and I've DJed when I have to. I'm, I'm ready to go, right? Yeah. And so this was kind of the same thing, except your whole team is everywhere else in the world, not right next to you where you need them. And so if you have something going on, you can't just say, hey, Peter, what do you think about this? You've got to like text someone or WhatsApp someone. Yeah, yeah. I, I was lucky to have found somebody on a website called Upwork who had a lot more experience doing kind of back-end Zoom stuff. So his name is Wiki, and I'm still working with him to this day. He was, he he was, he was like in India, wasn't he? He was. He so was. he was actually, you know, chiming in from India with, and he was handling all the, the behind the scenes things. But that was, I remember how many times I could hear you say, <laughs> Wendy, are you there? We need you. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny, Peter. I remember it, it took us a couple hours to get you up and running on Zoom because we yeah. were rehearsing for two, three days, just trying to get our, I was our total Zoom running. game. Yeah. And then, and then once you were up, you would just show up in the morning while we were trying to get our stuff together. Okay. And there you'd be, Peter Reinhardt. Right? Exactly. I thought we were. I thought we were going to all get together and have a meeting, and you were going to explain it, and you were still working up with Wiki to try to figure out the logistics. There was nothing to explain, really. Nothing to explain. And I, so I kept dropping in, and then, uh, and then the cool thing was is that you know, as I was learning to kind of log in and all, that I could just also drop out during when you started running the event. So I could sit in on some of the panels. I could say chime in with a few few words. I had my scheduled time when I could do a presentation on on the baking triangle and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, other times I would just be a lurker, you know, just be a, a yeah. rubber maker watching what was going on. Yeah, that was great. It was a cool event. And it ran for about three days. And it, it actually- Same three days as the Pizza Expo. Yeah, exactly when the Expo would have been. And so it was actually as a result of that, I used to call it the pizza party, the Zoom pizza party. That uh, that the idea of pizza talk came out of that because Brian Spangler dropped in a lot on on the party and Brian and I and John Arena were supposed to do a presentation at the expo called Tinkering with Your Dough and Tinkering with Your Dough was our you know was going to be our panel and yeah. so we did a little mini version of that you know on your party but then Brian calls me afterwards and says you know that went really well we should you know maybe we should keep doing it on Zoom and just recreate our panel for the for the people. Who, weren't able to come and and that evolved into pizza talk and so brian and john are kind of our most regular guys on pizza talk and we have we call them the pizza yodis and they come in and and we talk about tinkering with your dough and all their aspects of the craft of pizza making and of life you know they're yodis so they talk about a lot more than just pizza they talk about they're like they're like the uh, the elders you know the panel yeah. of elders and that panel of elders is growing as with the more that we talk with folks one-on-one, -on -one, then we invite them to come back and join the panel. So our, our Yodi panel is growing. Hold on one sec, hey, baby. Um, yeah, that's it. And this is uh, live on Zoom. This is what happens. It's, it's yeah, no, real. Normally, I have these noise-canceling, unidirectional headphones on, but they broke. <laughs> so, uh, Annabelle, I don't know if we can switch. Maybe for segment two. 
My wife is using to make, used to making lots of noise in the kitchen. Nobody can hear, and I'm pretty she, sure you can hear. She want to come on and say hi? <laughs> She's in her jammies, but maybe All I'll... Right. We'll, get, well, tell her to change her. Come on back later so we can hear. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Anyway, uh, so that was a really cool thing. And, then, and I, so I want to thank you for doing that and kind of, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, dropping me in the deep end so that I could learn about this new, this new medium, which, yeah. uh, you know, I needed to know about. And, uh, and of course, the, the world has caught up. But, um, but now what are you doing? So, so you know, you, at, I believe at the time that all this came crashing down, you, weren't you working on putting together a, a new pizza restaurant concept? Was that, is that what Slow Rides was going to be? Or is that no, no, no. Well, consulting? Yes and no. Originally, um, I, I've been in the restaurant business for a long time, since I was a teenager, pretty much. And, uh, and so I actually had a restaurant and nightclub for a long time, which was relatively successful. I mean, yes, it was successful, but you know, it was crazy because I was 25 and didn't know what I was doing and right. was funded, but we, we made it work. It was awesome. And so I always wanted to get back in the restaurant business. And I had this silly misunderstanding of pizza and bread that it was easy. Right. And so I actually bought your book. That was, that was like the, the beginning of my book. Oh, cool. Period. And Thank so you. if you look, if you look really closely, I still have all the, the, the greatest tribute to an author of all time is to see those little post notes in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so a buddy of mine here in LA who, who now owns a brewery, John at Smog City and his wife, Lori, we were all going to open a, a brew pub and I was going to do pizza and they were going to do beer, but uh, it all got messed up and not in a bad way, not in a bad way, but for me uh, as a restaurant professional, I don't have any, uh, any, uh, kind of grand ideas that I was going to just jump in knowing next to nothing about pizza and make it work. So <clears throat> I did what I thought I should do, which was get jobs at local restaurants and learn to be a line cook because that was like the only job I'd never really done in a restaurant. I mean, I jump behind the line and plate pastas and do whatever, but when I had my own place, but it's different than, than prepping and, and, yeah. and really running your own station. And then I also sent myself to baking school uh, French Culinary Institute in New York, wow. because I, I, I thought, all right, I had already, I had no offense, but I'd used your book and failed because really, um, you know, those books are awesome, but if you don't have any kind of grounding in artisan baking and you're trying to do anything beyond a pizza or two, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. I don't have to tell you. And so, um, you know, between baking school and line cooking and, and staging wherever I could, um, I eventually got better and better. And then by accident, um, I got into pizza consulting. <laughs> so, you know, I say by accident because when you're a freelance pizza person and your phone rings and somebody's like, hey, uh, a guy I know needs somebody at this place. Are you available? You're available, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I just made myself available to pretty much anybody who called. Yeah. And, and it started getting better, finally, you know? I mean, culinary school is great. I, I recommend it to anybody who can afford it. I took two months off of my life to go out and learn, to basically learn, you know, the basics of baguettes and brioche and yeah, and, and, bread and obviously we're living in New York then at that point for those two months at least. I had to I had to move to New York for two months. So you know? did you while you were in there in New York? Did you get a chance to like hit hit up some of the great iconic places? That, that was my plan. So here's what I did every day: I jump on the subway at about six thirty in the morning. Yeah, and I lived in like uh, the the bottom of Harlem you know, down below Columbia. I take the train down to, uh, to French Culinary, which is Soho area, uh -huh. uh, uh, a little bit south. And uh, I would be there from like eight to three. And then at three, I'd literally have your book in my backpack and I'd go to the far reaches of New York and yeah. hit up, you know, I'd try to hit up like at least two slice shops before dinner. <laughs> and then my wife who was studying for a big exam uh, in New York would hopefully come with me and we would, we would hit up at least one place for dinner. Nice. So that was about three places a day for 60 days, which is not nearly enough days. No, but it's still quite an immersion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I could have gone to a baking school in San Francisco at SFBI, but I didn't think they had the pizzerias to support my habit because I was a pizza junkie. Not, not like New York City, uh, that's for sure. No. And by then, and at that point, I, Tony still didn't hadn't opened in North Beach, and you know there was some of the great ones that are there now didn't exist then. There were a few old timers like Tommaso's, but no, San Francisco wouldn't have scratched the itch for you. It's really hard to say because it depends on you. But for me, you know, my my mom uh, grew up in Brooklyn, and you know that was Totano's where where yeah. she lived, right? 
And uh, I grew up going to Joe's Pizza kind of by accident. We would go into the city and we would go to Joe's. And, uh, and so for me, that was the only place for New York pizza, whether it was coal fired or, or, or just regular old deck oven pizza. Yeah. So I wanted to be there and I wanted to learn. And, and I met Roberto from, from Keste there. And yeah. I came back and worked for him for a couple of weeks at two locations. And that was great too, because, you know, that was probably just after Nancy Silverton had opened. And so there wasn't very much in the way of wood fired pizza going on in LA. And after working at Roberto's and, and learning at, uh, at French culinary, I, I could respond to any Craigslist ad and basically get the job because there weren't many people with wood fired experience. And also I had a, I really wanted to learn. I wanted to make dough more than yeah. anything else. I mean, I, learning to, to, to work a line is very important, but I really wanted to make dough and understand how that process worked and scale up. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what I did. It's quite, uh, quite an apprenticeship. And uh, like you said, you, you can only learn so much at a culinary school. I teach at a culinary school. We tell our students, look, this is to get you in the door. But your, your training really begins when you get a job and you're working the lines. Uh, you're coming to culinary school so you can get that first job and then get in there and, and, you know, and not make a fool of yourself and you know, have some skills. But uh, it's, there's nothing like real life immersion. And yet diving in without some preparation and training, you, know, you can get you know, messed up that way too. So it's cool that you kind of have plugged all those different holes. And meanwhile, you've got, you're developing and accruing all this life experience and you're running in, so you're running restaurants and, and clubs. So you put all that together and you've got a nice package. It's kind of cool that you got into consulting, which is interesting because as, as we're talking to more and more people, uh, we're starting to see that, that pizza consulting, which was like hardly existed as a, as a pathway for anybody before. Now you get guys like Anthony Falco, who is like the international pizza consultant, which is a self-proclaimed term that he came, great marketing. Uh, you know, and all of a sudden everyone goes, oh, he must know everything because he's international. And, uh, and then the jobs start coming in because there are people that are hungry for knowledge. And you know what's so great about like the pizza world is that really, I don't consider anybody competition because we all have our own little niche. There's only one Anthony Falco. There's only one Peter Reinhardt. There's only one Noel Broner. And none of us are at all the same. Technically, you could say that we all make artisan pizza, right? And each of us knows a little bit about this and that, but we all have our niches, right? And that's the beauty. It is. And, and the cool thing is, is that by teaching other people what you know, it actually deepens our own knowledge. I think the best way to learn anything is to teach it to somebody else. And so every consulting job that I've ever had has not only you know, paid well, but also and helped them helpful to the client, but it actually deepens my own, you know, my own knowledge base because you learn something on every job that you do. Yeah, well, you're lucky because you started off as somebody with a name, right? You had cookbooks behind you and a career. I started out as a line cook consulting, and so my initial jobs really didn't pay. I was doing it, I wouldn't say for the glory, but really just for the experience because yeah, yeah. I felt like whatever I made, whether it was 10 bucks an hour or a thousand a week or whatever I was charging back then. Yeah. And by the way, I was not charging a thousand a week, I wish, right? <laughs> Right. I felt like no matter what, I was being paid to learn. And when somebody yeah. said, all right, I want to do wood-fired sourdough. Can you do it? Of course. I want to do grandma pizzas. Can you do them? No problem. And then you're like, grandma? Wait, that's like Sicilian, right? Oh, wait. Thing, you learn that right uh, away as you always say yes. <laughs> you say yes. You say, because I think from, from the artist and pizza standpoint, once you understand fermentation, right? Yes. Once you have a working knowledge of how kitchens and restaurants work and, and how chefs think and restaurateurs, it's just really about moving the parts around. And, and I'm not saying that it's the same thing over and over because it's really not, especially when you start to work with chefs, because yeah. the first thing they do is test you and they find out where the, the, your limits are and then they push you past them. And that's why I love working with chefs. Yeah, and it's great. And, and you're right. And um, while we're being as helpful as we can be when we take on a job and we're, and, and you wouldn't get the job in the first place if you didn't have some knowledge to share that they needed something, a piece of their puzzle. Uh, but then, you know, then we keep growing and our repertoire expands. So, uh, 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 I'm, for those who are just joining us, I'm talking to Noel Broner and, uh, uh, we've been kind of catching up a little bit since the zoom pizza party and some of the other things that have led to it. But when we come back in our next episode, what I'd really like to do is talk about, okay, how now are you adjusting and pivoting, you know, in this COVID era? And uh, I, I know you're getting into a little bit of teaching here and there and, and doing, and, you know, and what have you learned in terms of 
this media immersion that we've all had uh, that we can maybe take into the future for all of us. So uh, if you could come back for another episode, we'll, we'll keep this conversation going. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll ask you to join us on the next episode of Pizza Talk. And um, with Noel, uh, we'll see you at the next episode. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Peter. See you soon. I know that uh, one of the benefits, uh, if there's such a thing as a silver lining in all this, is, is that uh, you know I'm learning how to take better, and I think other people are too, better care of ourselves, you know, and, and knowing, uh, remembering to wash your hands frequently and to not be touching your face all the time and wearing, well, if you, maybe we won't have to always wear a face mask, but at least knowing that that has helped to prevent transmissions of things. So maybe we won't get sick, even of regular things as often. I feel like I'm, you know, in, in better shape now than I was before all this came down, just because I'm taking better care of myself. So, so we're going to, and we're continuing our conversation with Noel Broner, by the way, thanks for rejoining us on Pizza Talk. Um, in our last episode, we were talking a little bit about uh, the, the, the pizza uh, party, the Zoom party that you organized and some of your, your own, you know, journey. Um, um, what are you doing now, now that, that the, you know, the projects themselves, a lot of projects have come to a, a slowdown and maybe there's not as much, well, it sounds like you're still getting consulting work. But, you know, what, how, what do you see for the future for yourselves? And, and tell me about some of these classes that you're teaching. Yeah. So let's see. It started with Zoom, Zoom Pizza 2020. That's what we called it. it. Started with Zoom Pizza 2020. Or sorry, God, it's backwards. Let's see. Pizza Zoom 2020. That's what we called it. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and so after that, you know, there was a little bit of, I, I, I kind of described myself like the, the Jerry Lewis, from the Jerry Lewis telephone. Like, pizza. Yeah, like, so after that. I had to take a shower, I had to take a nap, I had to uh, learn my wife's name again because I, I took myself out of circulation for like a week. And so after that, what was so interesting was that, all right, we raised a bunch of money, um, I kept uh, like the pizza vibe high in the community and a lot of people thank me for that. But, you know, I, I taught myself a whole new set of skills and, and, you know, anybody can jump on a Zoom call, even my mom at this point, right? But to run an event for 500 people a day taught me, all right, I've been wanting to do Zoom pizza classes or at least online pizza classes for a while, but I thought they'd be impossible. And now I no longer thought that because I saw what was possible on Zoom. And one of the interesting things that I saw on Zoom was that it felt weird, right? And so you're having these interactions and you're having like these lags in video quality or, 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 or audio and it doesn't feel right, right? You're talking to people, but they're in these little boxes and it, it just feels weird. But when you watch it after the fact, it's the yeah. same. It looks different and feels different, but when you watch it and you're not participating in it, it's pretty good. Yeah. So I thought, all right, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I've been doing, I mean, I, I work as a pizza consultant 100% of the time, and then one, once or twice a, a month, I would do these pizza classes. Sometimes they'd be in Los Angeles. Sometimes people would invite me to other states and do them. And so I was like, all right, I wonder if I could do this more often if there's a desire out there. And I don't really have a connection to the outside world. Uh, except through Instagram, right? And so my Instagram followers are hardcore. And uh, uh, so I, I started to just like, uh, you know, kind of put out like funny little pictures and, sing, and things saying, coming soon. You know, I didn't even know what to call it, right? But during, during Pizza Zoom 2020, I just thought, all right, this is going to be the future. And so I reserved um, ZoomPizzaClasses.com. And so I just started with the hashtag ZoomPizzaClasses. Oh. That's cool. So you actually got like a domain. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and and I'm not really using it, but I, you know, one morning, like the second morning I woke up and I was like, this is the thing. I can't believe it. And I just reserved it on, you know, GoDaddy or whatever, six bucks. And so when I was done, I was like, all right, how am I going to make this work? And so I, I kind of put out a, a teaser or two on Instagram and I talked to this guy, Wiki, that I was working with in, in India. And I said, hey man, I know we talked about this a little bit. I'd really like to do something with you. I enjoyed working with you. Can you help me? You know, I'm gonna, I want to make a website. I, I had Slow Rise Pizza URL, but I never used it. It said coming soon for six years. Right. So I'm like, I think I want to build a website and I think I want to do the same thing using Zoom and, and, and sell tickets. He's like, let's do it. So we spent about, I thought it would take a week, but of course it took three. And then three turned into four. So about a month later, I, I was pretty much ready. So about six weeks ago, I launched my first class. And I really didn't know how it was going to go, but people signed up like crazy. So I did a second and a third and a fourth. 
and in the and the in the first week, all the classes sold out except for the first one. And the first one would have just didn't give it enough time because that's the thing. I don't ever give anything enough time. As soon as I'm ready, I'm like go. Yeah. And so like I gave myself two days notice, but after yeah. that, people had three, four, five, six days notice. So all the classes are basically sold so out. What, what do you charge for a pizza class? What would they? Well, so I, I didn't know what to charge, and I'm I'm a chronic undercharger. So like for Pizza Zoom, we charge like five bucks. And what I, what I did uh, building up to it was I just charged like a dollar or two. And I did like these, I would, I would just like put it out there and uh, 50 people would show up on a Saturday or a Sunday and just ask me questions. And me and uh, this guy, Justin, who was my, was my co-host on. Uh, yeah, Justin's TV. great. He was, he was the co-host on the, on the big party too. Yeah. He's a funny guy. Yeah. So he's a, he's a, he's an actor in Los Angeles, super talented yeah. and funny and a crack video editor. So we started, um, you know, doing these uh, webinars and we would, we would look at them and edit them and use, we, we take like 30 seconds off of a, a four hour webinar that we did and like edit it and, and just like put it online and people would be like, oh, that looks funny. And 20 people would sign up or 50 people or, or two people, it depended, you know, nice. I'm not real good at that stuff and you never really know. Plus, like I said, I, I always give people like 24 hours notice and then I go live. So I'm sure I could, I could learn something about marketing. Excuse me for lots of people, but cut to six weeks later, pretty yeah. much all the classes are selling out. Uh, and what do I charge? So I started out at like 50 bucks for a beginner class, 75 for intermediate, a uh, hundred for uh, advanced. And um, uh, I've upped the prices a little bit since then. So they're 75, hundred and one twenty five. And I actually, I think I'm going to up them again because now I'm building in a new component where you can watch the videos after the fact. But there, I'm not just putting Zoom videos online unedited. We're editing them down and trying to make them a little more digestible. Uh, and so, yeah, that, I'm working on that right now. You know, the money is an interesting thing because what will people pay? Five bucks, 10 bucks, 50? And what I found is really interesting is that there is an appetite out there, especially right now, for baking and, and specifically pizza. And the problem I've had in the past is when I did those one or two classes a month, they would always sell out in LA. And I had people traveling from all over the country to come to them. Uh, not at the beginning, but after a while. But a lot of people said, can't you just put these online? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to put a, a bad product online until I know how it, how it works. Plus, I had my doubts. And I've always had my doubts about the internet. And I've always been wrong. And so what I thought was, how can you teach a, a bread or a pizza class? You need to eat the pizza. You need to touch the dough. We all need to be in the same classroom, right? Mixing together with right. the ingredients that I choose so I can control the beginning, the middle, and the end. Otherwise, how can you make a, how can you do an online pizza class when you don't even know the flour people are using? That's right. That's right. So there's a lot of challenges, but yet possibly now surmountable. Well, yeah, because once you do one, you, you realize what some of the challenges are and you adapt. Then two, yeah. then three, then four. Yeah. So after a week of pizza classes, I was like, wow, first of all, I can't believe how many people are signing up for these classes. Yeah, awesome. And also, they, great, they go really well. These intermediate and advanced classes, which, which at the beginning were my favorite, um, are great because you get these minds together. Everything from like 11-year-old girls who are great at baking and learn everything on YouTube to you know, famous chefs. You know, literally household names showing up. And so that's awesome. And I love that like confluence of, of talents and, and, and levels of, of uh, everything, skill. But then the beginner classes are also cool because I do a two-part beginner class. And it's usually two nights back to back. Uh -huh. first, first class will be like basically two hours of how to mix, right? How to stretch and fold, how to bulk ferment, how to ball, all these things, shaping and pre-shaping. And then the second version again two two hours will be like how do you open a dough ball how do you top it how do you bake it how do you hack your oven how do you prep your pizza peel you know what are the different styles right Neapolitan, right. new york uh, roman whatever and so it's great because all of us are making pizza together and we're all eating pizza together and sharing our successes and failures and it's the beginning class is awesome and what's really great which I never, which never happened to me in the in the real class. Well, the real class, I guess, you say. in the on-site classes, is that yeah, we all make dough together, and then I wheel out a giant cart of dough that me and Justin had made the day before, and it's great, of course, because we know how to make dough. But then these people are like, okay, I get it. I hope I can do it at home. But now they're actually doing it one night and then eating it the next night, and they're like, 
I can't believe I made this. Like I've been making pizza for 20 years. All of a sudden you're showing me stretch and folds and pre shapes and maybe temping your dough. Maybe not. We don't do that in the beginner class has made a huge difference. And you see these light bulbs go on. Yeah. And then people sign up for another, other classes. I think when they interact with you during the classes, it's set up in such a way that they can ask questions and, and, and dialogue with you. Yeah. So the way that works is that basically, um, there's different levels in Zoom, and so you have attendees who are both basically silent, but they can uh, communicate through chat. So we promote everybody from attendee to panelist. So we're all basically on the same levels. Uh, I'm a uh, what do they call it? I'm a host, and Justin's a co-host. So we can take people out of the meeting, or we we can uh, mute their mute their uh, audio if they if they Zoom bomb us. They're hecklers. <laughs> No, we don't really have any hecklers except for like my mom. Who always yeah, right. mom <laughs> it's usually the people who know you the best are the hecklers. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. that, so that's so. So have you had to put a cap on how many can participate, the, or, or or is there no limit because it's it's Zoom? Well, it depends. So at the beginning, I was capping them at about uh, I think sixteen for the for the beginner classes and maybe twenty for the intermediates. But as we get better, we can handle more people. So yeah, we can do 25, 30, and now we're doing classes on Airbnb on the Air Experience platform with up to 100. That just started actually yesterday. Oh. So a lot of what I do, it, it's like anything else that I've ever done in my life. You think you're doing something new and you think it's gonna be about A, B, and C, and then people call and say, yeah, but can you do D? And you're like, no, but I'll try. Yeah, so yeah. a class for 100, Wall Street Journal, sure, why not? So today I have a meeting at noon with a woman in New York and we're going to talk about a big class. Uh, and also like, I love the Airbnb platform because most people think of Airbnb as a website you go to for hotels, yeah. right. Or places to stay. But you know, they contacted me about a year and a half ago about this new thing they were doing called experiences and an experience is, could be anything, but their idea is, yeah, let's do a pizza experience. And I'm like, that's dumb. Nobody comes to LA to do, to make pizza. And so what ended up happening was that, yeah, that's true, but you have a lot of LA people who hack the, who hack the Airbnb platform for stuff to do in LA. So they thought 80% of the people would be the 5 million people coming to LA a year to stay at Airbnbs and 20% would be locals. It was the opposite. 80% were locals and 20% were travelers. And so it was another great, well, it was a, it was another way for me to get in touch with people who wanted uh, to learn how to how to bake, yeah. uh, and so you know, and and it put me online as well, and so it's like a lot of little baby steps. I didn't even know about that platform. So now, so what do you offer in the intermediate and then in the advanced classes that you're not offering in the beginners classes? Well, well the, the the beginners class is really just an opportunity for people to. I, I start real slow, so flower types right? Hand mixing. We do a, a two hour mix, right? And we, we go through some of the artisan steps. We go through, all right, this is an auto lease. And now we add the yeast and now we add the salt and this is bulk fermentation. Let's write down the temperature of the dough. We're not going to do anything with it. Let's just write it down. Let's do some stretch and folds. Let's, let's feel the dough, right? Is it getting stronger, right? How does it feel? Is it sticky? Yeah. And then, you know, and we talk to people about different choices they're making and, and then, and, and it's great. Then for the intermediate class, it's a lot like French Culinary Institute, I suppose, because I'm really like, all right, guys, that we're taking, we're taking the training wheels off. Let's make some, this is a three and a half hour seminar, right? And I actually, for the first time in my life, I've never had the time to do it in, a, in an on-site class. I walk people through the 14 steps of artisan baking that they taught us at French Culinary. Every single step, and I explain how they're all interrelated, uh -huh. We do we do basically a short mix or a hand mix in the beginner class. We do an improved mix in the intermediate class, uh -huh. and then in the advanced, we do the intensive mix with the add-on of what some people call hyper mixing. Oh, you know? have you heard about that one, Peter? Hyper mixing. Uh, hyper mixing, yeah. So it's interesting because there's a unless you're talking heard, about like a food processor or something like that. Well, no, no, no. So basically, it's this: it's the intensive mix. But yeah. the, the authors of Modernist Cuisine and Modernist Bread, I read their Modernist, uh, I tried, I, I kind of, 1,400 pages or something. I, I, I browsed their Modernist Pizza uh, library and uh, they came up with this thing called hypermixing. And hypermixing is when you do a long, longer than average intensive mix with a high hydration dough. It can be 20, 40, 60 minutes, oh, yeah. hours. Yeah, I, now that I've heard about, 
yeah. Yeah. And I didn't so, know it was called okay. hyperfiction. Um, Neither did I. But, but that's interesting, because you know that the uh, modernist cuisine folks are working on a modernist pizza series now that's going to come out. It hasn't come out yet. They've been working on it for a few years. They always announce it about two years before it actually comes out. So you want to hear the worst thing? Expecting any time, maybe this fall, it'll, it'll hit the streets, you know. I can't wait for that to come out. I'm, you know, I'm, I, you might think that I'm really good with technology, but they contacted me maybe two years ago to see if I yeah. wanted to participate. And they, they DM'd me on Instagram. At the time, I, nobody was DMing me. I was really new to stuff and I didn't even check. So six months later, I saw the message and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe. And I emailed them and forget it. You're what too late, you, Noel, six what months. What DMing mean? I don't even know what that term is. Direct messaging. And so- Oh, direct, okay. See, I'm, that shows you how out of a loop I am. So, so yeah, so that's why every time I talk to you or anybody that, that knows more than me, I'm picking up like new terminology and new, yeah, yeah, yeah. new ideas. So. So, um, yeah, so that series should come out and that will, you know, kind of build off of their Modernist Bread series, which uh, I got to participate in that to a small extent. And it was amazing, fun. Amazing, right? and, and I got to visit their, uh, you know, their labs up in, up in the Seattle area. Um, I can't wait for the pizza book to come out. Yeah. In fact, we're going to try to get uh, uh, Stephanie Swain, who, who did appear on, on the Zoom pizza party. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to get her to come on and do a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one so we can catch up and find out. I know she's, she can't really announce when it's coming out until they actually know when it's coming out. So she always says, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. But we're gonna, I want to get her to talk about some of the adventures she had in traveling uh, really all around the world. She got to, to do the true pizza quest on Nathan Mirvold's dime, you know, where he sent her everywhere uh, to gather information and talk to the, the great players in the game. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, so the pizza classes are working out for you quite well. Is it because it's keeping you pretty busy now? It's it sounds like it's a growing enterprise. Yeah. So, you know, after about six weeks of classes, what I'm the next phase is going to be putting them all online so people can access them not live but at their leisure, and that's what people have been asking for. And that's a whole other thing that I really don't understand because you've got so many issues to contend with. You know, you've got bandwidth and load speed, which is very technical. You've got video security. Right, yeah. so you don't want people being able to access and download your stuff and do whatever they want with your product and your brand. Right. But you know, it's very hard to stop people from doing what they want to do because they're going to do it. But that sounds like the Craftsy model, which you and I have talked about before. Craftsy has a, a lot library of thousands of these great instructional courses that people can they pay for them and then they have they get a code and they can download them at their leisure. And I think that's a, that is a great model. Um, so, and then I think, uh, Udemy or Udemy is another platform that does the same thing where they have these courses. So there could be a way to maybe either, you know, uh, for them to, uh, I don't know, using as either as a model or to use their platform as a way to make those available to the, you know, the yeah. general public, because yeah. yeah, what's the point? I mean, it's one thing to do it live and have people there when it's really happening, but then you've created all this intellectual property. Yeah. Why not be able to make it available and sell it, you know, to people who missed the window on that one, so you don't have to keep repeating the class over and over again? Well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, uh, quandary because I think um, the, the thing about teaching is I, I really actually love it, and so I don't, I don't think about teaching as a chore. And yeah. so when I, you know, before COVID, I would get up on a Saturday or a Sunday and go to teach a class, and it would be my, that would be my day off. And I would have 25 people coming to service restaurant supply in LA and I'd have to get there at six 30 in the morning and they'd get there at 10 and I love it. I really like teaching, but my problem is that I, I like teaching on my own terms and that's what zoom has afforded me. I do what I want. Right. And so I'm just hoping that people will respond. And we, we talked about this yesterday a little, Peter, when we were chatting about what we were talking about today. And I think it's really interesting, these, these, these platform choices that you have, right, in the yeah. digital playground. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is avoid all of those platforms and kind of create my own because I, I, I don't know if it'll work. I really don't. And there's a good chance that I'll fail, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, working with these big companies that set all the rules, you can say this, but you can't say that. And this is the length of your video. You really shouldn't go over like two hours. I'm like, my, my, my intermediate classes are three and a half or four hours. I don't like to stop at an artificial time if the class is still going. Right. I'm going to answer every question no matter what. 
Yeah. And even when I'm done, there's always going to be two lingerers that have 10 more questions. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah. In fact, when you're teaching a live class, there's always a couple of people who stay while you're trying to do cleanup who just want to keep picking your brain and get, and there's, and that's fun. That's fulfilling. And I think that there is something so fulfilling about teaching, uh, whether it's in, in front of a live audience or, or, you know, just, just sharing knowledge. And that's one of the things we've really learned in doing these, these uh, pizza talk uh, interviews is how much joy uh, the, the, the people in the game have for making pizza, for sharing their knowledge with each other. That's why pizza expos and these gatherings are so important to us because people love to share what they've learned. It's like sharing, swapping war stories and, and, and nobody's kind of like hoarding their knowledge because they know that we're all in this one big game together and there's enough to go around. Yeah. You know, what's going to be interesting if there is a pizza expo in Vegas next year is that I have to figure out what the digital component's gonna be. And that's gonna be awesome because, yeah, there are 20,000 people or however many people there are a day at the Pizza Expo. What about the hundreds of thousands or millions of people that aren't gonna be there? You know, and it makes yeah. me think like, wow, you don't really need very much to either live stream or, or Zoom or, or, you know, whatever, your, whatever your, your platform is. And so for me, you know, what I think is interesting is that yeah, I'm starting to go back to my normal life and I have a bunch of projects that are that are starting that have already started. And right now I'm doing all my consulting virtually. And so I've got clients all over the world that I'm working with, mostly on Zoom and phone and email. But pretty soon, you know, I've got restaurants opening in LA, uh, you know, this month, next month, the next month. And right. so the, the challenge is going to be, I still want to do one or two live classes a week. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get my library of classes up so people can access them, right? I want to, but now I'm like, you know, maybe I don't have to fly to to Beirut to do a project. Maybe I can do a lot of it on Zoom, yeah. and maybe I don't even have to be there for the opening. Not that I don't want to be, but yeah, it really opens up the world to me, and I think a lot of my clients, because think of the expenses. They have to fly me out. They have to put me up. Yeah, right? yeah. It, there's a trade-off for all this because the, there's such a, a, a intrinsic pleasure of being able to travel and, and experience the cultures of these various places. Uh, and that's part of what I love about getting on the road is going to, yeah. you know, even th within the States, cities that I've never been to or, and, and, or revisit. Uh, but then again, the cost and the hotels and everything else adds to, you know, the ticket price. So uh, if you don't have all those expenses, you, you might be able to offer a better price to the client as well. Absolutely. So, It'll be interesting to see how things change and what, what the new normal is going to be. Um, yeah. but you know what? I keep saying this, is, and, and, and what I'm seeing is that I know there's a lot of suffering going on in the world, and I, I know a lot of people are unhappy, um, and, and for good reason, and that includes me as well. Yeah. I'm definitely suffering, and I'm definitely unhappy, but I'm also looking around at all the people who were successful, whatever that means, you know, before this whole thing went down, and I'm seeing the ways that people are re readjusting. Right. And for me, it's, it's actually really inspiring yeah. because people who were hardworking, contributing members of society before this went down still have an opportunity to do the same thing. They just have to do it in a different way than they were before. Right. Yeah. And you were talking about a friend of ours yesterday who's one of the biggest you know, pizza personalities in the world. And you said we were talking about the phone. He was actually delivering pizzas in his car. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, yeah, that's what that's what chefs are doing now. Right, whatever it takes, just like when they started. It's the first thing you learn when you get into this game is you do whatever it takes, you know, to make it happen. Yeah. And, and so, it has to have that attitude, uh, and, and and not just chefs, but chefs intrinsically, you know, are, are imbued with that. That you've got to do whatever it takes to get through that shift, to get through the day, uh, and to deliver the service. Uh, well, we could talk about this forever and ever and ever. So why don't we get back together in the future after we've been a little for deeper into this, the cycle of things and as we see how it does play out as we return to various stages of normalcy and you can, you know, kind of catch us up on how you've, uh, you know, made it happen. And, then, and, and we'll share, we'll just keep swapping life lessons as we go along with this. And Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for being part of Pizza Talk today and for sharing, you know, your story. Thanks for putting on that big show and good luck with the, the classes. If people want to um, sign up for them, do they just get to you through, uh, through your uh, Instagram? Is that the best way? Yeah. I'm slow rise pizza. I mean, like 12,000 followers on Instagram. That's pretty amazing in itself. It's pretty uh, amazing. And you don't even have a, you know, you don't have a restaurant. You've got, 
you, it's just your you, your brand. So that's how did you build that up? I gotta know that before we begin. That's, and that that was kind of on accident. I used to just like uh, email and text people pictures of pizza. And a buddy of mine, Matt from Tribute Pizza, we were going to the Pizza Expo actually, probably close to ten years ago. I used to tag team with different people every year, and we'd go and share a hotel room, and and we we try to scam badges off of people, and so. I took my phone on the car ride there. We were driving through the desert. Like, give me that thing. <laughs> What's your address? What's your wife's name? So he, gave me, no. <laughs> yeah, he, he made me an account with a password. He's like, here, your slow ride pizza. Stop bugging me. And I was like, he's like, how many followers do you want by the end of the next three years? I'm like, no, 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 no. I, do, I don't want that. I don't want a million followers. I want people who are like into what I'm doing. I, and I didn't understand then what followers or friends or any of that stuff was. I didn't want 250 friends I didn't know. I just wanted like three that I did. And well, so that, yeah, I think organically. That you, did, that you don't know, but many of you do know now. So person by person over the course of probably five years. I don't know. I honestly don't know how many years ago that was. It must have, it feels like 10, but it was probably five or six. Yeah. yeah. I just climbed and climbed and just yeah, kept yeah. posting. Mostly pictures of dough and crumb <laughs> shots. And you know what's amazing to me about social media? Like my people, I get more likes on crazy bubbly dough shots and interior shots of dough than I do on like pizza. And so it's really not about yeah. the pizza so much as the process and like the inside yeah. of the process, which is- Well, really let's face it, you know, close-ups on dough structure is a very sexy thing. You know? right? modern, is, modern is bread. I can't, wait to, I, but I can't wait to see what they do with pizza. I know when I, when I was doing my early books and I would ask the photographer to come in closer for certain shots and they go, no, we don't do that. That's food porn. We don't do that. This was before there was this, all this internet stuff. And I said, but but people want to see up close. And then, you know, I'm kind of laughing now because now it's all about as close as you can get it. It, yeah. it is the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, the microscopic look into, into, into structure and cell structure. And, yeah. and that's just one of many ways that people, uh, you know, connect. Peter, I just want to thank you again for, I know you published a lot of books. Right, and I know the the Bread Baker's Apprentice was your big book, but for me, this was like one of the books that that, that got me into pizza and caused me to like thank dive you. down the rabbit hole. So, thank well, you for having me on. Thank the you for fun book I ever wrote. I tell you that it got That's me the place I got before. But so thanks again for for spending all this time with us today. I look forward to uh, circling back with you, and we'll get you back on Pizza Talk in the future. Right. Thanks, Ben. Have a great day, and good luck with the next phase. I'll need it. Thank you. Appreciate it.